welcome everybody to um, this afternoon panel. I know many of you have probably already participated in a series of panels since 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern time in the U.S. this morning and wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is uh, Sabina Marks. Uh, I'm a social scientist and communication strategist based in D.C. Uh, I've been working in the area of decision making under uncertainty uh, for couple decades with a focus on risk perceptions, human behavior, and communication of scientific information. Um, I've applied social science insights to real world settings, uh, such as climate change impacts on water management, energy conservation, public health, and disaster preparedness. Uh, given that um, interest and background, um, I was both excited and uh, honored to be asked to moderate this panel, which touches on many issues uh, very dear to my heart and to my profession. Um, our panel today is, uh, the title is How Can We Accelerate Learning About Containing COVID-19? And um, if we want to minimize the impact of COVID-19 on societies around the world, um, we need to accelerate the process by which we learn which strategies are most appropriate for each country. Um, the asynchronous nature of the spikes in COVID cases around the world provide an opportunity for policymakers to learn from other countries. Uh, however, the challenges um, that many countries are currently experiencing in mitigating the impact of COVID-19 suggests that there are opportunities to accelerate learning clearly um, in how policymakers identify which policies to implement and very importantly, to communicate those to the public. So our panel will explore these questions, um, the virtues and limits of preparedness measures in pandemics, um, how data visualization can accelerate learning, and how to determine community level risk tolerance and effectively tailor risk communications to ensure populations adapt um, uh, to living uh, with the virus. Our panel features a series of um, experts from social science, global health, and behavioral science. And I'll briefly introduce our speakers, um, and then um, they will each have 10 minutes um, for their presentation before we go to um, a Q&A. Our first speaker will be Michael Wilcock, um, who is the lead scientist with the World Bank's Development Research Group, um, where he has worked for over, the, over, la over 20 years. He also serves as a lecturer in public policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Uh, and uh, over the past uh, several years, he has also spent time at University of Cambridge and the University of Manchester. His research focuses on strategies for enhancing the effectiveness of policy implementations and extending the work of his recent book, um, which is titled um, Building State C Capability, Evidence Analysis, action uh, together with Matt Andrews and uh, Lance Pritchett. Uh, he received many awards, uh, among them the um, American Sociological Association's Award for Best Book in 2012 and Best Article in 2014 on economic development. His undergraduate degrees um, uh, are from the University of Queensland, Australia. He has an MA and a PhD in comparative historical sociology from Brown University. Our second speaker will be Derek Willis, um, who is a health economist and currently the lead, uh, leading the development of On Frontiers COVID-19 Expert Health Desk. Um, he also serves as a senior health specialist with the World Bank, um, where he examines how recent innovations in surveillance and vector control technologies for mosquitoes could increase the cost effectiveness of dengue control um, programs in the Caribbean. He is a member of the Expert Scientific Advisory Committee for the USAID Grant Challenge on uh, combating Zika and uh, future threats. And he also served as an Earth Institute uh, Fellow at Columbia University, where he engaged uh, in work with the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions uh, and the in International Research Institute for Climate and Society. He received a PhD from Princeton University in Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy. He has a master's degree in international development from the Harvard Kennedy School and under an undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia. And our third speaker, uh, last but not least, will be Shata Chakraborty, who is a risk and behavioral scientist whose work is motivated 
by the need for clear, credible, evidence-based communication to urgently and proactively manage the risk that th risks that threaten um, humanity today. She is the US representative uh, for We Don't Have Time, the Sweden-based tech startup that launched Greta Thunberg to viral global renown. And um, uh, she's also the founder um, and principal of Adapt to Thrive. Um, several of you may know uh, Shetta from her uh, radio show, Risky Behavior, uh, on Eaton Radio, uh, as well as the uh, podcast, um, the Climate and Security Podcast. She is a regularly interviewed uh, expert on many news outlets, uh, including um, CNN, BBC, MSNBC, Fox News Channel, uh, to name just a few. Shata uh, earned her doctorate in risk management from King's College in London, and her undergraduate degrees uh, are in decision science and international relations from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Um, clearly, we have uh, the experts here among us, and I will now hand it over to our first speaker, um, Michael Wilcock. Um, and I see you already um, kind of like uh, sharing your screen. Um, wonderful. Um, please. Um, Take it away. Thank you. Oh. Uh, Michael, you are muted. Can I unmute you? Can we unmute Michael? There we go. That's better. Hear me now? <laughs> Good, sorry. <laughs> um, thanks to the organizers for including me in today's conversation and thanks to all of you for listening in and giving up whatever else you might have been going to do this afternoon to uh, contribute to this conversation. Um, just a slight addendum to the introduction given to me. I'm the lead social scientist, not lead scientist. That's a difference that matters. <laughs> um, part of what I'm going to talk about today is, or mostly what I'm going to talk about today, is the, is the need for sort of lots of modesty, lots of good first principles, and uh, lots of good theory, which is essentially to say, kind of, in one sense, we need to double down on our, on our nerdiness when we're engaging with these issues, but we need to be doing what I think people who've wrestled with lots of problems for lots of time need to say, which is that uh, much of what we're dealing with is inherently uncertain, and especially in this particular case, when it's, when it's un literally unprecedented, we have to be correspondingly modest. It, in these types of circumstances, one has a, a temptation to uh, seek vainglory and uh, prominence by being overly confident, by sounding very sure about what one thinks, and I think uh, we need to be um, much more modest most of the time in terms of how we convey what we're saying and how we uh, connect what we're saying to, the, to, to policy. Um, I extend this a bit by, uh, uh, by trying to go to the next slide. How do I do that? I'll try that. There we go. Um, uh, there was a, a nice article in New York Times a couple of, um, a couple of weeks ago um, by uh, Nicholas Kristof, but he was citing uh, Michael Osterholm, who's a Regents Professor at University of Minnesota, a member of pretty much every learned society and high-level policy group you can imagine uh, on, on, the, on the issues of the moment. And um, I was very taken with what he said in that interview and uh, I took the time actually to send him an email <laughs> to this, <laughs> congratulating him for saying what he said, because when you're as prominent as people like that, who've spent a whole career wrestling with this stuff and you can go on the New York Times and say, I know less about viruses now than I did 10 years ago, um, that seems to me a, a pretty high <laughs> standard that we should be setting when uh, those of us that find ourselves in these types of situations are asked to pontificate on things. Because so, um, I've been wrestling with uh, implementation questions and other issues for a long time, and I, I would like to say <laughs> I know a little bit more than what I knew 10 years ago, but I think it's the, the inherent nature of social science is that there's just a lot of uncertainty that characterizes it and we're not doing our jobs unless we're honest about those degrees of uncertainty. Um, the one issue that I am actually wrestling with full time at the moment is a, is a big poverty report for the World Bank, a big global assessment of the nature of uh, an extent of poverty and inequality at, at a global level. So one of the obvious questions that uh, we've been asked recently, of course, is well, what effect is COVID going to have on all of these uh, trends that we're looking at? So I'm just going to present a few quick slides just to give you some 
substantive <laughs> input, and then I'm going to try and sort of uh, do, do what I just said I think we all need to do, which is to be pretty uh, humble about uh, how we talk about these things. Um, one of the things that we've uh, that our colleagues have been able to show uh, most recently is that we roughly expect about 50 million people or so will be put into poverty in the developing world as a result of COVID. Um, and the original expectation that the world has had that we would reduce extreme poverty, uh, poverty at a level of around $2 a day, uh, we would eliminate that essentially to 3% by 2030. The most recent reports have always suggested that that was at best going to be a, a mid 2030s accomplishment. Um, but now it looks like it's probably going to be delayed by at least another three years as a result of that. So, and that's set up Ceratus Paribus. That's assuming nothing else goes on besides uh, an awful pandemic. And there's a lot of deep uncertainty associated with that. So I just, as, as much as you and, and I sort of marvel at the uh, at these graphs that I'm just presenting to you now, you, the amount of work that goes into producing them <laughs> is just unbelievable. Dozens and dozens of people need to show up to work every day just to produce a graph like that. And the people that do that kind of work will be the first to tell you that there's just unbelievable amounts of uncertainty and assumptions and everything else that go into producing them. So when I say and produce numbers like uh, delayed by three years and poverty going to rise by 50 million, um, there's just an enormous amount of work behind the scenes, as it were, that goes into producing those kinds of numbers. And uh, part of what I'm going to be getting to on all of this is that as much as those kinds of numbers are really important, we need to have them, they are doing most of their work, I think, by precisely the kinds of activities we are engaged in now, which is talking to each other <laughs> um, and having constructive evidence-informed conversations about things, because it's only through the inter interaction and intersection of different forms and of expertise that I think we really move these kinds of debates forward. Um, Africa is likely to be, of course, the area hit hardest by this, largely because it's the poorest, the poorest continent with the weakest implementation systems and the, and the largest numbers of, uh, of people living in uh, very crowded situations where social distancing and the like is, is unlikely to be able to be enforced. There we've got sort of the historical trend was that uh, this was heading down, which is very good in the bottom, but then we have a, a red line for where we think it probably will go, but a worst case scenario as well, that it, that it will get the poverty rate, the number of people living on less than 2% could in fact revert back up to, to where it was uh, seven or eight years ago. So that's a, that's a big amount of time to have lost as a result of one big pandemic and then a uh, pandemic. And then obviously trying to cost that out and trying to show what the implications of that are for human welfare beyond just uh, income is just in, is enormous. So it's not going to be good. <laughs> and I think the first principle that comes out of a lot of this kind of work should be that disaster always and everywhere pretty much hits the poorest and, and most vulnerable people first and longest and most consequentially. Uh, and that as a first principle should be largely how I think about how we respond to pandemics right here in the US. There's a nice story in today's New York Times, if you can find it, um, just documenting in an exquisite uh, graphic and uh, summary detail the ways in which you know, COVID is playing out across the income spectrum, across different class groups uh, here in the United States. So um, there's lots of good evidence we have that uh, we, our first principle should be to protect those that are the most vulnerable. And uh, we don't often do that, <laughs> um, but I think evidence can be a, an important part of the way in which we engage with that. More broadly, though, we can also see that um, there have been attempts to try and put metrics around the preparedness of different uh, countries for the pandemic. And a, grave, a brave group of people in October last year, you, know, you may have seen this, uh, produced uh, this big report, the Global Health uh, Security Index. Uh, trying to rank the, the, the world's countries on their preparedness to deal with a pandemic. And um, I do not at all want to be seen to be second guessing the good people that uh, spent lots of time and energy putting that together. If you look at the report and the panel of people that did that work, it's a that's an A-list of, of people that you would want to doing that. And I'm sure I would have concurred with all those decisions if I was sitting around the table back in September and October when the final reports were being done. Nonetheless, I think it's pretty conspicuous that you see the United States ranked clearly number one in terms of its preparedness for a pandemic. And yet, 
and yet <laughs> which country is suffering the most deaths so which country is suffering the second most number of deaths the uk ranked second best in terms of its preparedness which country has actually per capita had more deaths than the united states sweden uh ranked there at number seven on the, no, number six on the on the on the list so these things are are deeply imperfect and they, they we need to have them we need to be taking them seriously uh, but we also need to not have something other than just a, a standalone metric as a basis on which we engage which, with deeply complex problems. Um, if we drill down into these, into these uh, sources of evidence a little bit, though, I think we also can see uh, other ways in which this kind of information can be useful. Uh, the U.S. ranked number one in the world largely because of the fact that it has a very high skilled uh, workforce of epidemiologists and medical professionals who work on that, which is great. You need those kind of people. Um, but if you look at uh, where the U.S. did worst, it was in access to healthcare. Indeed, so bad is the U.S. access to healthcare, 175th in the world, the same as Guinea. <laughs> um, it's just unbelievable that so we have a mismatch here in the U.S. between uh, what the smart people can do if they were, if, uh, when they're allowed to do it, and yet the, the more routine uh, questions of justice and access uh, that shape who actually gets access to all these services, how, how do we uh, respond most effectively when we know that these kinds of pandemics are going to hit the most vulnerable people most hardest, and yet we also know that, or should, be, should have been much more attuned to the fact, I think, that uh, the, the access issue was just going to be potentially the Achilles heel of how the, the US uh, came to respond. To it. But even with that, I think we need to recognize that there's, it's all very easy to be wise after the fact on so many of these issues. And so the way you have to deal with uh, deep uncertainty ex ante up front uh, is to have good first principles and good theory. And I think I've been uh, most impressed uh, in, in the stuff that I've been reading about COVID from uh, by the work of uh, a journalist at the Atlantic, Ed Yong, who's been uh, just doing masterful journalistic work, summarizing and interpreting and uh, dampening down the enthusiasm for, for single explanation accounts of, of how things are going. So I just want to conclude with some of the things that he's written about, because I think he expresses it in, a, in journalistic eloquence <laughs> in ways that I would just uh, want to echo uh, very, very strongly. Um, the first is that, there's, that these things are just, the, the, the essence of a highly complex problem is that it has a whole number of different moving parts, some of them interacting pretty closely with each other and others that are sort of uh, making differences around the side. So he says, you know, we, we need to recognize that, of course, social distancing matters, population density, age, structure, wealth, social collectivism, good luck, uh, whether you do or don't wear masks, matters under different conditions rather than others. Uh, there's recent stuff showing that genetics may make a difference. There's a story about that in the Washington Post today. Um, so there's a lot, there's so many different things going on. And so uh, you can be, uh, be a, a famous talking head by saying there's one thing we need to do. And saying, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff we need to be doing. And so uh, that's what good theory would tell you. But the good principle is, again, that once you're in a, in a highly complex situation, you're going to just see lots of inequality, huge variance in the ways in which things uh, are playing out. And you need to have a, a, a way of you know, responding to those effectively. Um, and so then it be, from, a, from an evaluation point of view about how we then assess what we've done and how we assess whether what we've been doing is working or not, uh, that just becomes really hard as well. And uh, it's not obvious, I, methodologically or any other way, how you engage with these kind of questions. So when we look at um, uh, whether states open, uh, uh, opened up too early or too late and all the rest of all these big issues that matter in some narrow kind of sense, but they're always done as part of a, a much broader package. And so we need to keep asking those questions, but we need to do what good science does, and it iterates its way to finding out better theory. It iterates its way to being able to come up with some, uh, some good broader messages. But it's the essence of what we're dealing with right now uh, that, is, that, that, that it's characterized by this enormous heterogeneity in the, in the ways in which factors contribute to it making evaluation super duper difficult. <laughs> and the final thing that we need to worry about, and this is something I've written about for many years now, is just the, the, the highly uh, erratic way in which these kinds of impacts unfold over time. The cause and effect you know, interpretation is really hard when you have a nonlinear process by which 
uh, events unfold over time and make and, and, uh, the, this time lag between when an action is taken like a lockdown and the effect that it may or may not have two weeks uh, when it's non-observable and when the absence of an outcome is regarded as good <laughs> as opposed to a good thing happening which we can all want to happen um, and be able to measure it so the absence of something is really hard to measure as well so I guess my, my point with all of this today is that it's, it's great that we have more and better metrics being able to be thrown around and to be deployed and to be harnessed to all of this, but uh, we need to uh, join with our professor in Minnesota and say, well, we just need to be really humble in terms of how we deal with this and humble for good scientific reasons, because what we're dealing with structurally has, has so many moving parts. It's so many, it's so erratic in the way it unfolds. It's going to make all the decisions we make uh, inherently cautious with lots of asterisks, lots of caveats. And it's our job to highlight those. Uh, we're not in the business of selling solutions. We're in the business of trying to find ways of getting to solutions. And a lot of that means just being really good on our theory, uh, really good on our first principles and really good at our communication. And I think those are the best things. If that's the best we can do in the circumstances, I think that's uh, what we're called to do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael, uh, for leading us into this much more nuanced picture of um, uh, the different uh, indicators and uh, measures that we're using in our, um, in our judgment and, and decision making. Um, and with that, uh, I think uh, we'll hold questions until all three presenters have, um, have presented their work. Uh, and with that, um, we're um, handing it over to Derek Willis uh, for his presentation. Great. Well, thanks, Sabina. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Sabina mentioned, I'm the Global Health Lead at On Frontiers. We're a technology startup, and we launched the COVID-19 initiative in March. Uh, the goal of this initiative is to accelerate learning about COVID with a focus on developing countries. Uh, the focus of my talk today will be on how data visualization can accelerate learning uh, about COVID-19. Following up on what Michael presented in the previous talk, Experts often exhibit overconfidence when it comes to complex topics. So Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman stated that overconfident professionals sincerely believe they have expertise, act as experts, and look like experts. You will have to struggle to remind yourself that they may be in the grip of an illusion. His colleague Amos Tversky wrote in 1992 that the significance of overconfidence to the conduct of human affairs can hardly be overstated. So studies have identified overconfidence in a wide range of professionals from physicians to security analysts. In regards to COVID-19, the overconfidence of experts may inhibit learning. We may enact policies without accounting for the true cost and potential impact of those policies. So now data visualizations represent one means of accelerating learning about complex topics. For example, let's consider the flattening the curve visualization that's now deeply ingrained into our discussions of COVID-19. Although the origin of this concept may be a CDC paper published in 2007, the visualization began circulating more broadly in late February. A few weeks later, the concept had reached a wide audience, potentially affecting the behavior of millions of people. So what are three simple steps we can use for developing data visualizations that affect learning about COVID-19? Well, first, we need to precisely define the question we want to address with the visualization. Next, we need to, to then identify the most relevant evidence for that question. And finally, we need to identify the most appropriate indicators to represent that evidence. Now, what happens if we don't follow these steps? For example, what happens if we use the wrong indicators? Here's a map that MSNBC displayed repeatedly on TV for viewers on April 22nd, and has continued to update daily since April. We can assume that the question MSNBC was trying to address with this visualization was, what is the difference in COVID-19 risk between states? They used the cumulative number of cases experienced by each state as the indicator. Now, what's the problem with that indicator? Well, it leads to a map, the one on the left, that is almost identical to the map on the right. The map on the right only illustrates differences in the population of US states. There are only about five states that have, difference, that have different colors when we compare these two maps, the one on the left and the one on the right. So which indicators should the network use? Well, they should use cases per 1,000 people instead. The map on the right here shows what the network's map would have looked like if they had used cases per 1,000 people rather than total cases. You can notice the significant difference in the two maps. MSNBC is still using the wrong indicator, total cases, and just updating a version of that map on the left every day. 
So how can we use the data visualization to accelerate learning about lockdown policies? So let's define the question as, what is the relationship between lockdown policies and risk of new COVID-19 cases? Given that question, the most relevant evidence is severity of lockdown policies, cases, and testing. The indicators we should use for cases and testing should be cases per 1,000 people and testing per 1,000 people. And for the severity of lockdown policies, we can use an index developed by Oxford's COVID-19 government response tracker that ranges from zero to 100. Now, how can we visualize those three indicators in order to understand the relationship between lockdown policies and COVID cases? So the y-axis here represents the number of tests per 1,000 people, and the x-axis is number of cases per 1,000 people. So obviously countries that will be displayed on the left side of this, of this figure are experiencing a lower number of cases. So let's focus first on New Zealand. On March 21st, New Zealand experienced 14 cases and began increasing the severity of their lockdown policies. The increase in the width of the line represents this increase in the severity of the lockdown policy. On March 31st, the country had 95 cases, the most cases on a single day that the country has experienced since the pandemic started. After March 31st, testing increased dramatically, represented by the line going up. The highest level of testing in New Zealand was on May 9th with the country experiencing only one case on that day. Now let's turn to South Korea. South Korea experienced its highest daily number of cases on February 29th, 909 cases, and then had a reduction in cases without imposing the more severe lockdown policies that were, that were used in New Zealand. Italy experienced its peak in cases on March 22nd with around 6,500 cases. Uh, and after March 22nd, there was an increase in testing and a period of more severe lockdown policies. Cases decreased over this period, and on May 30th, Italy had only 516 cases. For the US, the red line in the figure, you can see that the US has never implemented at a national level, based on this index, the same level of severe lockdown policies that were implemented in New Zealand and Italy. The peak in US cases, based on five-day averages, was around April 10th. Since April 10th, there's been an increase in testing, but again, with less severe lockdown policies than Italy. Indeed, the US has been, to use the terminology of this conference, unlocking. It remains to be seen if the U.S. can continue to decrease its cases on this current path. Returning to the previous presentation by Michael Wilcock, remember that the severity index we're using here, developed by the Oxford Group, is a composite measure of nine indicators. The index may be omitting important policies or not assigning the appropriate weight to each indicator. Researchers should continue to explore how to improve this index, and perhaps a different index is needed for groups of countries that share some fundamental characteristics. So what are the next steps for using data visualizations to accelerate learning about COVID-19? So three points. First, we need to understand how super spreader events are blurring the relationship between policies and outcomes. Second, we need to centralize evidence and indicators as much as possible. Finally, we need to use crowdsourcing and a multidisciplinary approach to improving existing indicators and potentially developing new indicators that can accelerate learning. All Frontiers is developing a multidisciplinary team to accelerate learning about COVID-19, focused primarily on developing countries. Feel free to contact me if your organization needs support from our team. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, and um, thank you, everybody, for uh, staying uh, within your 10 minute limit. That's fantastic. Um, and uh, which uh, means uh, we can now hand it over to um, Shata, uh, who will take us uh, even deeper into um, uh, our risk perceptions uh, with regards to COVID and um, um, other risks um, um, that we're facing in the world. So Chata, it's all yours. Okay, great, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm a risk and behavioral scientist. I study the complex interconnected global risk landscape that we all reside in. So despite the Paris Accords limiting our planet's warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius by the, by the end of the century, we're still currently on track to actually reach 1.5 degrees warming as early as 2050. This means more intense, frequent, simultaneous climate change impacts like hurricanes, droughts, wildfires, and most relevant to this panel, emerging and persistent infectious diseases. Climate change and the increasing number of people on this planet means increased habitat encroachment and destruction, which is through interaction with exotic wild animals like why COVID actually emerged, increasing interaction with bats, porcupines, snakes, not just for food and trade, um, but so for food and trade, and all of this res results in an emergence of disease. So I'm on EcoHealth Alliance's Leadership Council. It's a group based in New York City, 
and it leads disease surveillance and mitigation. We've identified 1.67 million viruses that could make the potential zoonotic animal to human jump and begin human to human transmission. The fact that we haven't had more COVID type outbreaks is really what the story should be, given the bad human behaviors like wildlife trade, like wet markets that are increasing the probability of these viruses to get loose from their animal host. COVID is also a mild disease by virology standards. There is potential for far more lethal viruses to emerge and we've seen from COVID how disruptive even just a mild virus can be. So the takeaway is we need to stop these viruses from ever emerging in the first place. We need to proactively prepare because when there isn't an outbreak, there's complacency. And when there is an outbreak, there's panic. That's what I study, why? So I look at this as a behavioral scientist to understand the gap between risk reality and risk perception. These are rarely aligned. People are not well calibrated when it comes to assessing risk, especially when risk is cumulative. The example I give when I teach is that the risk of smoking one cigarette versus the risk of smoking one cigarette a day over time, people find it difficult to make that distinction. If you think of it as just one cigarette, despite it being every day, then you're skewing your assessment of future absolute risk, in this case, lung cancer. So I've talked about this a lot analogous to COVID. 2020 this year, in fact, actually a report came out today saying that May does have the highest recorded global carbon emissions yet. So we might see a shift in this, but uh, it looks as though 2020 will see a global energy emissions decrease um, up to 8%. And that's significant for one year, but it's a blip on the planet warming trajectory that we're on. That's like not smoking one cigarette one day on the path to lung cancer. So this makes sense when you explain it like this and people understand it, but it's not intuitive to understand cumulative risks. Our brains aren't, aren't wired in that way. Our brains haven't caught up to the complex risk landscape that we now reside in. Our ancestors' risks were seeing a snake and running away. That's worked great for human evolution. Think about it, we probably aren't related to those ancestors who didn't run away when they saw a snake. So while our brain's cognitive wiring has worked out for us through the majority of our species' time on Earth, it's less helpful to us now in the complex risk landscape that we find ourselves in. We aren't designed to understand or conduct complex risk analysis, but we have to overcome that cognitive limitation, especially given that we exist in a world with increasingly strained resources. So not conducting cost benefit analysis to understand real risk and rather making decisions based on perceptions isn't just unhelpful, it's truly costly. And so let's see just how wrong we have it. And I'm gonna share this graph that shows, it's a visual illustration of risk perception versus actual risk. And it doesn't exactly portray the relative proportions of annual deaths in America listed, but you can see how much we, how, what a disproportionate response there is across certain risks. There is significant public outrage when it comes to risks like plane crashes, 5G, GMOs, swine flu, versus their actual base rate statistics of occurring, versus risks like heat, radon gas, Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, in comparison to um, that those risks are actually attenuated. So perception of risk is uh, perceived as far less than is actually the case. This shows just how not well calibrated we are, how we systematically do, do not align to the reality of the risks that we face. And why is that? It's because humans don't conduct, conduct the risk benefit analysis that's required to get to the actual annual fatalities with some of these risks. Rather, we allow value-based factors to determine how, how much risk we're going to attribute, how much perception we're going to attribute to a risk. And these are the factors that either increase or decrease our perception of risk. And it's, these are a handful. There's been many more that have been studied now, but uh, the few that we can also apply to COVID and think about it as we go down this list, COVID really does hit every single one of these cognitive hot buttons. Think about how natural we consider a risk to be, how, control, how much we can control a risk, how much scientific knowledge do we have about the risk, how familiar is it, how voluntary is our exposure to it, what is its catastrophic potential? What is the severity of consequences? What is the immediacy of consequences? Who is affected? Is it vulnerable children? Is it elderly? Is it pregnant women? 
And how equitable is the risk? Is there an equal or unequal distribution of risks and benefits? And so think about where COVID really falls across, the, across this risk perception value scale. Every single one of these boxes is hit. And so one more factor that plays a huge role in our perception of risk is trust. And in addition to the role of trust, we, it, it's a significant influencer and it's been something that I've spent a long time in my career studying. Trust is broken in American society and in science. We're more polarized than ever as a nation to the point where medical and public health science isn't even immune. For a long time, scientists would showcase infectious disease as one of the rare few risks that you couldn't use to identify a person's political affiliation. Think about it, based on whether people believe in climate change or not, you can actually determine where they fall al along the political spectrum. And you can determine that from people's views on genetically modified foods. But infectious disease, we thought was immune until COVID came along. Now, we know that conservatives attribute less perceived risk to the threat of COVID-19 here in America. We don't have the data yet to understand the annual deaths associated with COVID-19 to be able to truly situate it alongside existing disease states and other risks. It doesn't appear though that it's going to reach Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease risk levels. That, those diseases consistently kill hundreds of thousands of Americans a year. But comparatively, we spend a fraction on those disease states in terms of saving lives. This isn't rational, but we aren't cognitively wired to be rational. As I explained, the value-based factors that contribute to higher public perceptions of risk all apply to COVID, and that's instinctually what guides our decision-making. So without systematic, multidisciplinary, evidence-based approach to understanding the real risk of COVID and equally the impacts of the policies implemented to offset the primary health impacts of COVID, perceptions will prevail. Policymakers will react to perceptions, not to the analyses that are really required to fix and contain COVID. So what does this mean going forward? We must apply the gold standard of risk perception and communication science to appropriately contain COVID. That doesn't mean zero risk, which historically the public has always demanded from policymakers. Whether we're talking about food we eat or the air we breathe or exposure to diseases like COVID, zero risk is unrealistic and we do exist with cost benefit trade-offs. Increasingly, we'll see people trading off risk of COVID to access their favorite restaurants and bars. But the critical takeaway from this talk is that trade-offs are not universal. We see higher levels of risk tolerance in societies like Sweden, and we see higher levels of risk tolerance for COVID right now with the greater perceived risk that has emerged on police brutality. So we need to remember risk perception is fluid, it's transient, it varies over time and across groups. So this is why it's so critical to get the numbers right, to do the thorough cost benefit analysis at the community level before and inevitably complacency sets in. And complacency will set in. We're in the midst of Corona right now. So it seems impossible that we'll forget just how bad this was, how disruptive it was, but we're cognitively wired to return to complacency. We can only comprehend process and stay alert to risk for so long. And once the perceived threat dissipates, we return to default. Think about it. Do you remember the panic and then when you stopped caring about SARS and MERS and Ebola? This is how we're wired. It's so bad and we've become so complacent to disease that we've already even found solutions for that we have the audacity to stop vaccinating our kids and seeing some of these diseases even reemerge. We need to break this cycle. The key is to take advantage of the cognitive window we have during a crisis like COVID and put a stop to bad behaviors like the wet markets and establish better widespread cultural norms like minimally disruptive but effective enhanced hygiene measures that can and should persist long after COVID is forgotten. The time to do it is right now while we have the public's attention and when people are looking to feel better about those value-based factors that are creating those greater perceptions of risk. People wanna regain control. People wanna protect the elderly. People wanna reduce involuntary exposure. So this is the time that people are looking for solutions and we can really make an impact and change human behavior. So we do this through communication. Effective communication is achieved first by mapping risk perception in various demographics, communities, or however we can group people in a way that communications can be effectively tailored. They then have to be delivered through a trusted communicator for that specific group. You would not have the same message for the, a middle-aged white woman, for example, in Missouri, that you would have for an immigrant Gen Zer in New York City. But the same risk information needs to reach them. 
and it needs to be interpreted as intended. This is what needs to be considered as we learn from COVID and move into the next phase of reopening. So I'll just end with the importance of taking perceptions of risk into account is key for developing effective communication strategies to establish evidence-based interventions that will survive COVID and will survive our complacency. We are still on a planet warming trajectory. This means more intense, frequent, and simultaneous impacts of climate change, including emerging and persistent infectious diseases like COVID. We cannot afford to not learn from this and start from a better place next time because inevitably we'll be needing to apply it again soon. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shata. Um, we are, um, and thanks for taking us into this um, much more subjective perception of risk, which uh, is such a determining factor in basically all of our decision making, individually, organizationally, and societal. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, open the Q&A. I can see if there are any, um, um, any questions here um, yet. Um, Okay, um, we get some, I see some compliments in the chat. Uh, excellent, excellent. And thanks for this wonderful presentation. And if you are, um, if you have a question, uh, please uh, use the Q&A um, function in your Zoom, um, on your Zoom screen. And while I'll wait for the audience to, um, uh, let me just check with our um, uh, tech person. I assume people will, type their questions into the Q&A rather than activating their mic function, if that is, uh, is that correct, um, Jasenko? That is absolutely correct. And okay. they can even, uh, but it's completely up to them, either Q&A or chat. Okay, Q&A or chat, excellent, great. Okay, good. And uh, while we're waiting for some of the participants to um, write in their, um, their questions, um, I would like to ask maybe uh, all of the panelists um, in, um, uh, in the work that we do, very often we, uh, we see a phenomenon called like the finite pool of worry, uh, which refers to uh, we can only worry about so many things at once. And I think Shata alluded to like uh, COVID, climate change, um, police brutality, um, um, it, all those aspects, um, environmental, political, um, public health, um, safety, security, uh, national security, uh, all those aspects, all those domains where, uh, where we're dealing with risk. And um, COVID is really only one of them. But um, how can we have the attention, uh, either through visualization, through other forms of communication, or through better preparedness, um, so that we can tackle more than one issue at once, or be prepared for one more than one issue at once? Um, to overcome this finite pool of worry, um, if not for everybody, but at least for policymakers um, who are who are really uh, determining which direction very often we go. And I want to, whoever wants to take that question first, how do we address or overcome this finite pool of worry? Or maybe it's not possible at all. <laughs> Great. Uh, just as a side note, while the speakers are thinking about that, there are two questions in the chat, if uh, directly to two of the speakers, if you want to take that. Okay, great. I, yes, I do see them. I do see them now. Um, okay, so, well, uh, so I, let me repeat the question you just asked, and then I'll take a stab at it. So how do, we, just so I make sure I got it right, because I was distracted by the questions in the chat too, that I want to make sure one question I want to address, what are the behavioral nudges uh, that we should think about coming out of COVID. So maybe I'll start with that. Um, so I just had the Behavioral Science and Policy Association annual meeting just occurred. Normally it would be, it's between New York and DC every other year. This year was, should have been in DC, but obviously it was all virtual. And there was a lot of talk about this, like exactly what are the learnings and what, what are the uh, evidence-based measures that we should implement? Because they're just good sense. The ones that have the evidence behind them, that's critical because a lot of the measures that we've seen put in place that I talk about as severe distancing measures don't have science consensus necessarily. I initially thought we were throwing kind of everything in the kitchen sink at this. And given the magnitude of the risk, it's understandable that we need to feel that we're taking some sort of control and action, but without 
having the evidence behind measures, it can be really risky. And then ultimately, what is the cost benefit of those policies that have been put in place? We have barely just started to do that. We're not, I mean, the models are literally happening as we speak. And so I would recommend that what we need as for sustainability going forward, because again, this is this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It's a risk that's going to take its place in the risk landscape and we're going to learn to live with it. We need to make sure that anything that we promote is evidence-based and that as of right now, um, and again, we're learning so much in real time, but as of right now, that is enhanced social hygiene. That makes a lot of sense. We've known that for over a hundred years, wash your hands. So it's those kinds of things that I highly recommend that we really put in place because as intuitive as it seems, it's not, it's not, it's shockingly not carried out in the way that we would expect at this stage in our human, where we are as a human species on this earth. So measures like that can definitely be nudged as well, easily, um, just making it much more, bringing it to people's attention, making it easy, having stations for hand washing, having Purell stations. I mean, we've seen a lot of that, but again, complacency sets in, people stop behaving in a way that's good for them. We just need to continue from a policy point of view to promote those cost-effective strategies. So that's my take on that. And then I'm sorry, Savina, if you, could you repeat the question that you asked? Well, it was a question about like, how can we overcome our finite pool of worry? Um, we can't, I mean, like we're wired to think uh, more, mostly about like something that is currently present and then we're panicking about that. And we can't keep multiple risks on our radar at the same time. So you mentioned climate change. We're looking at um, political unrest or um, social inequality, um, right. environmental risks and health risks. So how, we can, how can we overcome that in our, through communicating with the Yeah, team? yes, it's really complicated, but ultimately it's understanding we have to prioritize as those that are in governance as in what is, what is number one priority? And then based on that, what do you need from the constituents that you represent? How do you understand what their needs are? It has to be two ways. So it has to be prioritizing based on the base rate statistics of the various risks, because we have limited resources, we have to allocate, we have to prioritize, and we have to allocate according to the base rate statistics. And then bottom up, we need to understand various communities' perceptions on risk and where the disconnect is. And that's through various methods, so try, tr tried and tested social science methods, like uh, the mental models approach is a good one, where you can actually map where perception, what people are scared of, what they're not, you know, what they're, where their erroneous beliefs might be in relation to a very real risk, compare that to the expert model, and then see where those gaps are, and then find the effective communi design communication strategies to close that gap. That's how you're going to align perceptions to reality. And that's how you're going to have cooperation and commitment to the policies that are then put in place. Great, thank you. Um, did um, any one of the other speakers, Derek or Michael, um, uh, speak to the question of the finite pool of worry? Uh, if not, we can go to some of the um, audience questions that are popping up now. Okay. Okay, then um, let's um, move to um, the, um, the question that I see here. So Shata already answered um, one of those about nudges. Um, here's a question from Dr. Hallie Robbins um, to all panelists. How will current political unrest versus distancing measures be assessed for risk as well as for next waves of COVID infections? How will it be counted by tests for antibodies or antigens, um, by hospitalizations, or other metrics? So this is a question about uh, metrics, um, maybe um, to Michael or, or Derek. So linking the current um, protests uh, and lack of distancing measures during those um, and that risk for a new wave of COVID, um, how, can we, how can those cases be counted? Sure. So I'll, I'll take an initial stab at it. So I think I think one of the main, as Michael mentioned in his presentation, I think a, a real challenge to learning about COVID is this this lag, this this kind of you know one to two week delay between uh, when an infection occurs and when when symptoms um, are exhibited. So I think I, mean, I think researchers will probably figure out a way to kind of understand the impact of of a lot of this uh, kind of unrest over the last few days on COVID cases, but it may take a while. So I don't really have a, an easy answer to it, but I think that is. I think we, we will kind of figure out what kind of impact it has. And this is kind of, unfortunately, a, 
you know, for many, many reasons, kind of a, a natural experiment about what, what happens when, when people actually start uh, going out more and, and different parts of the country. And uh, I think we'll, we will get estimates. There are, there are ways of kind of developing indicators and developing the data to estimate how many people went out and maybe developing even rough estimates of, of you know, the degree to which people were wearing face masks. But I think this is unfortunately like a learning opportunity to really see what happens when, when uh, you know, since when people start going out in that way. But I think we'll, we'll figure out, we'll, we will get some, um, you know, evidence and learning from this, but it may, may take a few weeks for the researchers to figure out the right uh, way to, uh, to analyze it. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, Michael, did you want to speak to this? Or I think the next question might also be um, highly relevant to you. Um, want me to move to the, to the Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. Given our time constraints yes. here, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd uh, the next to the one I'm slightly better positioned to, <laughs> to respond to, which is the next global steps. And I, you know, it's a truism, but uh, yeah. global problems require global solutions. And so that's in principle why we have a multilateral system. It's designed to deal with precisely these kinds of things. And, uh, but as consistent with what Sreda was saying before, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of trust issues <laughs> that need to be a part of this conversation. But as uh, the, the, the big issue that I think, uh, multilateral agencies are better to better, better position perhaps from a comparative advantage perspective to deal with is the is, is dealing with just the the availability of the raw PPE kind of materials that are needed these awful examples we saw of just of uh, you know what 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 chances Malawi got of out competing other <laughs> out competing big countries when it comes to getting access when they've got like two ventilators in the entire country right so um, I, to the extent we just, uh, what's true domestically is even more true internationally in terms of the power that different constituencies can wield to be able to get what they need to be able to deal with that. The global steps to right those inequities uh, should be the responsibility and the mandate of, of, of and why multilateral organizations exist is to try and do a much better job on that, on that kind of front. So, but you know, that 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 turns on the on on the, their ability to be able to deliver on those kind of things, and that's true. I think back to the other questions as well. Isn't is there are, there are sort of good evidence based ways in which we can think about uh, the nature of the problems and the efficacy in principle of what the response mechanisms might look like, but it's ultimately going to come down to can the the the, the designated organizations who are charged with doing this work actually do whatever it is we're proposing. And I think my instinct would always be to sort of, on some sense, work backwards from what our understanding of the prevailing capabilities are to do this kind of stuff. And rather than getting people to take on tasks, they're just not able to perform. Just literally, it's going to be too difficult and too complicated, complex, even if it's actually the right thing to do. Um, <clears throat> the prioritization and the allocation of brain power and resourcing uh, and, and media messaging is, it, I think, has to take mass, much more seriously than it does. The the capability of the of the designated systems to actually do that kind of work. So I'm speaking to you from Massachusetts right now, which has otherwise been a pretty badly affected state. But I'm pretty confident that things won't go too bad here, just because the, the capabilities of the systems in this state to do that work are enormous. And so what would be prioritized here uh, might be prioritized, might, be, might look differently in, 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 other, in other states or other communities. So the, the, the variation in capability is going to be enormous as well. So our job, I think, here is, is to do all the kinds of things that all the other panelists have talked about. But my pitch, my plug, <laughs> is always to say whatever policy we come up with, whatever recommendation we have, uh, it's 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 re lived ex uh, reality. The effectiveness of whatever we propose happening is going to is largely going to turn on whether the system can actually do it. And so much of what we're going to see unfolding in the next month in developing countries is just what happens when we ask systems to do work that's exactly what they should be doing, but they just can't. Yeah, and I think so. You mentioned how do we get PPE into uh, into all the countries that need it, and then it's like um, from my experience, like. The availability of uh, PPE um, doesn't necessarily mean that people actually use it. And there's like one very concrete question uh, here from Ravi Murthy um, Anupindi. Uh, what nudge could be effective in ensuring that people wear masks, assuming that masks are available? Um, Shata, <laughs> I don't know if that's a question for you. Uh, so what so nudge could be effective in, in yeah. encouraging so people to do we make this maybe the last question? That and then we'll unfortunately, would have to be the last question. I'm yes. <laughs> so sorry for the next two questions that were posted there. Um, 
but uh, hopefully they were answered implicitly. Um, yes, very leave us with a very concrete step. <laughs> Well, first, first we need to have consensus that mask wearing really does reduce in a significant way um, the, for healthy people to get COVID. It doesn't appear that there's consensus on that. The World Health Org Organization has directly, is in conflict with the CDC on their guidelines for wearing masks. So that causes distrust. I mean, if taking a broader view of this, when you have authorities and scientific organizations and scientists arguing with each other publicly, all that does is across the board, it reduces trust. So if and when there is consensus on the best measures to put in place, um, you're, um, a lot of people cognitively will turn off. And that is a real risk that we as a science community have to understand and fix before we can really put any solid recommendations forward. So let's say we do agree that wearing masks is something that is helpful um, in healthy people to reduce the transmission of COVID, then the idea is to do the training, education, and awareness that's required because other than, until then, really any added benefit, even if it is marginal, is not going to be gleaned if people are not trained in doing things correctly or properly. So I would say, let's start there. <laughs> let's get some consensus around what we as a science community uh, support and then let's get the communication campaigns going to ensure that people are following and interpreting the information as we're intending them to. Otherwise, it's a lost cause. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer. And thank you for every answer and all the, um, the, the wonderful uh, presentation from, from the three speakers today. I think um, as a, if, um, I had asked people to end with a closing statement, we are running out of time. Um, but I think, um, We've clearly seen that as scientists and uh, so-called experts um, uh, to appeal that uh, we um, ought to be not overconfident, we learn from each other. And unfortunately, we're not faced globally with a neatly designed random control uh, trial um, that would allow us to, uh, to learn um, in a very systematic way. So hopefully people are not discouraged uh, from learning from each other. And the most important thing is that we uh, see that we are um, that we have to learn from each other and that our knowledge continues to evolve and that we build in new knowledge into our existing uh, knowledge and we update our belief systems uh, and our risk perceptions continuously as new information becomes available. And with that, a uh, big thank you to our panelists and the organizers of the conference. And thank you very much to our tech support without whom none of this would be happening. Um, and uh, I'll release everybody to the, um, the next panel, which uh, should be starting um, like three minutes ago. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you guys so much. Thanks everyone. Thank